So, uh, this, Albert, thank you. The, the, uh, uh, the deal on Richard is an amazing one. You may remember him. I had him on the radio with me a few times. The Mark Thompson Show. He's called uh, Richard Green the Civics Dean because he brings the workings of government to people nationwide and worldwide. He is such a remarkable both consultant when it comes to politics and also mind when it comes to so many of the things going on in today's world. Appreciate him taking a minute to join us during this very serious time. And I want to speak about how what's happening in American politics in the House of Representatives can actually overlap in not such a great way with what's happening in the Middle East. How about it for Richard Grant? Hi, Richard. Hey, buddy. Happy anniversary. Yeah, thank you very much. We um, uh, it was quite the experiment, and it seems to have worked out so far. Really appreciate you being here. So, well, everything everything you do turns to gold. And I told you that I saw you, in fact, in one of the greatest movies of all time, The American President. I don't know if your listeners even know that you were the star of that what? film. <laughs> well, I love the way you characterized it—the star of that film. Yes, uh, it was a pivotal scene. I will say that. And I know it was. That because of uh, the director of the movie, Rob Reiner, came in and was talking to Richard Dreyfus, and I was on the chair like adjacent to it. I was just overhearing it. And he said, now this is a critical scene in the movie. And that's how I knew that I wouldn't get cut out. <laughs> but, but, uh, but thank there you, you for rec recognizing my work. Yeah, that was the Sorkin movie, uh, American President. So uh, Richard, you know, you you have done so much and interact with some interacted with world leaders and politicians uh, across the board. First, a general take on what's happening in the Middle East, and then can you speak to the House of Representatives, which is in such chaos, and how that might, as I say, inter interconnect with uh, American policy in the Middle East right now. I mean, there is so much going on. By the way, your last guest, John, was very eloquent and very powerful, and I agree with most of what he was saying. I mean, this is such a cluster, you know what? Um, first of all, I, I've been to Israel many, many, many times, and I'm still shocked that the Israeli intelligence, the Mossad, didn't see this coming. So that is going to be a very interesting discussion for a long period of time. But my prediction is that because of what's going on in Israel, that Kevin McCarthy may in fact be returned even on an interim basis to be speaker to help us through this period of time. What? Initially, he said, initially he said, I'm done. But then he just recently said that he would be willing to serve in any way, shape or form if that would help bring the, the conference, the Republican conference together uh, and even for a short time. And then, of course, we have Donald Trump who said he's willing to be the interim speaker, which I think would perhaps be the most chaotic thing ever. But it's it's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, it's fascinating. And, you know, I, I think the the Trump part probably, uh, you know, it's just one of those things to take up a news cycle for 20. I don't know how seriously it. But but the other options are are not so great either in the GOP, are they? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't <laughs> I don't see how they're going to get to 218 without Democrats because you know they just have a very very slim majority the republicans do and you have eight bomb throwers who don't like kevin mccarthy who seems to be the consensus choice of the vast majority of the rest of the republicans i think steve scalise is the most respected most likely person but jim jordan is first of all i think totally unqualified and a total divisive guy um, but well, he, he denied. He, they're both election deniers, aren't they? I mean, isn't? Uh, I mean, I suppose Jordan would be head of the parade, but they're plenty in behind him. I, I don't. I can't find a proposed leader of the House that you know will acknowledge that Joe Biden legitimately won the presidency. Yeah, well, I think that ship has sailed. I mean, I think that conversation is getting old as we ramp up to 2024. Okay. But, <laughs> Nick, you know, listen, I'm the Republican Party is what the Republican Party is. And as someone who wants good governance, I actually am rooting, except for helping Israel and, you know, the Ukraine and doing the things that government has to do, I am actually cheering on the sidelines for the maximum amount of chaos. Well, the maximum amount of chaos, Richard, would involve the shutting down of the government, which I think is a very, very big potential now without McCarthy. You have nobody in charge of the GOP 
to wrangle that crew and avoid a government shutdown. Many of them want it. They, they hate government. They're winning every day right, that the government Mark, is shut down. Exactly. Listen, of course, no one wants a government shutdown. I think it's, it's, it's ridiculous, completely unnecessary. But the vast majority of people who support the Republicans and will continue to vote for them have no idea how the Republican Party is doing what they're doing. And if there is chaos at some point, I think people will begin to understand that we cannot have a party committed to shutdowns and complete chaos running the country in the future. I, I'm my my focus is on 2024 because the, the the cake is is baked for the rest of this two years. Because you are such a political maven, let me just ask you about the breaking news of this morning, which is that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has declared his candidacy as an independent. He will run as an independent. Speak to that ripple effect on the coming race. Oh, my God, this is fascinating. And I listen, I've known Bobby Kennedy not well, but I've known him for 25 years. I've gone skiing with him. I've gone falconing with him. He's truly one of the most brilliant human beings I've ever met. Um, and by the way, I do not think he's an anti-Semite. I don't believe a lot of the things that people say about him. But the Democratic Party, in my opinion, uh, brought this on. Uh, Bobby Kennedy, who is being managed by Dennis Kucinich, both hardcore Democrats, desperately wanted to have a Democratic open primary debate and discussion and competition. The Democratic Party not only didn't allow that, which you can understand because they're all in for Biden-Harris, but they, they, they treated him like he was a pariah, like he had you know some communicable disease. They wanted nothing to do with him. They wouldn't give him any opportunity to even have a, a serious conversation about his vision for the Democratic Party and his vision for America. I'm not saying I support him. I'm saying I saw this coming a long time ago. He yeah, had so no. Yeah, but, but let me just follow up. You're saying because of his treatment as a pariah, it forced him into this third party candidacy thing. You, so, so to press that, you're saying if they'd engage with him at all, he likely wouldn't have declared this. If they said, listen, you know, you're a Kennedy, you're a lifelong Democrat, uh, you and Marianne Williamson and whoever else wants to compete for the majority vote of the Democrats in the United States, go at it. This is a Democratic Party. We're going to conduct democracy. And if you win, you win. And if you don't win and Joe Biden gets the nomination, we, we're going to count on your support. And they would have had Bobby Kennedy's support for Joe Biden had they treated him like this. I know Bobby well enough to say that that's true. So, so the, in yeah, so the so, institution, the, Demo the, the, inst the, the Democrats, and this is, again, my beef with a lot of the stuff with the Democrats is that it's institutional Democrats that run the party. You know, they're always called progressive and communist and Marxist. That's, they're, they're, that's the farthest from what they are. I think the reality is they're quite institutional and they didn't want to primary Joe Biden. They didn't want any kind of uh, competition for Joe Biden. Isn't that essentially what you're saying, Richard? Yeah, and it's, it, it, it does remind people of what the Democratic Party, the DNC, did to Bernie because they favored Hillary. And that is not a good look for the Democratic Party. And by the way, I have to tell you, I'm at a conference here in Boulder, Colorado. I just spoke to uh, Douglas Brinkley, who is a historian. I've been speaking to a lot of people, including members of Congress. Behind the scenes, people do not want Joe Biden to be the Democratic nominee. They don't. They think he's too old. They think he's vulnerable. And the point, I even had this conversation with Andrew Yang, and I said to Andrew Yang, what happens if Joe Biden, after he is nominated, right, the last three months of the campaign, has a 19 second Mitch McConnell brain freeze? It's done because Kamala Harris would then step in. And I do not believe that she could be elected president. So this is bizarre. So not only do we have the oldest president running for reelection, the most unpopular vice president who would be a fail safe for someone who is that old, and we now have Cornell West running. We have Joe Manchin potentially running and we have Bobby Kennedy running. Mark, I've never seen anything like this in all my years in politics. And it's impossible. Anybody who tells you they know what's going to happen is 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 on drugs. 
I this mean, is co- a very co- fluid situation. And yet the alternatives, I'll let you go here in a second, but the alternatives that you've just mentioned, I mean, that is to say those who stepped up, uh, they don't seem super viable either. I mean, uh, Cornell West, uh, um, oh. Marion Williamson. I mean, again, I'm not I'm not saying that some of what they say doesn't land with me. I, I'm, I'm just talking about their viability politically. But here's their viability. Jill Stein probably cost Hillary Clinton the election. Ralph Nader definitely cost Al Gore the election. Third parties are never going to be elected. Marion Williamson is not going to be president. Corn- Cornell West is not going to be president. But when you win key battleground states by 10,000, 12,000 votes, they can actually and have and very well might change the election. So I'm concerned about Bobby coming in. I just encourage the Democratic Party to say, okay, listen, we're going to invite Bobby back in. Let's have an open primary. Let's have debates about the issues and let the best man or woman win. That's what democracy is all about. And that should be what this party does. Well. The problem with America is that we have given, in, and our founders, I think, did a lot of this. Uh, we've we've created a system, essentially, in the Electoral College that gives minority voices, and, and, and when I say minorities, you know what I'm talking about, political minorities, uh, right. an oversized say in who will be the chief executive. It's absolute insanity. The Electoral yeah. College is insanity. Do you want some good civics behind the scenes? Yes, info? give us You're some good own- civics behind the scenes, and then we got to say goodbye. Please do it. Okay. So, for anyone who's listening, who may be, who may live in the state of Virginia, or know someone who lives in the state of Virginia, there is an election um, in the first Tuesday of November this year, 2023, where every single state senator in Virginia is on the ballot. Every sing- single uh, House of Representatives person in the state government in Virginia is on the ballot. If Democrats can hold the state legislature, the, the lower house, and pick up one or two or three senators who support the national popular vote interstate compact, Virginia can add 13 electoral votes to end the Electoral College through this National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, which already has 205. So it would go to 218. We only need 270. And then every person's vote will be the same. So wow. get out to get out to vote in Virginia. That state is critical to making this happen. And yeah, I think the Electoral College is one of the worst, most anti-democratic things in the history of so-called democracy. Yeah. Richard, you're great. Come visit again. I appreciate you taking time out of your conference there to join us. Richard Green, everybody. Thanks, Mark. Happy anniversary. See you. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.